Welcome back everyone to the weekly mailbox. If you don't know the drill by now, this is the weekly show where you can ask questions about absolutely anything you would like. Formula One, Formula E, motor racing, anything in between. If you want to ask a question for next week or any of the following episodes, feel free to do so in the comment section down below. Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff. Today's video, number 38 of the mailbox, it's going to be straightforward. We're going to be going through five questions, as we always do, starting off with some pretty straightforward ones, getting into a few more deeper questions. But also today, before we get to question number five, our audience participation question, don't worry, it's not as scary as it sounds, I've also got a little bit of a channel update. I just want to quickly go through because a few of you have been asking me what's going on with the Twitch stuff at the moment, what's going on with open lobbies, what's going on with the YouTube side of things. So I want to clear that up. But first of all, I want to talk some F1. I want to talk some juicy questions. And our first question this week comes from Gamer. I don't know if it's... Uh, and if you're new around here, I can never pronounce names. So if you want to submit a question, just be prepared. I'm going to butcher your name. I don't know if that's a way of saying Kieran or Chiron. So Gamer Chiron is what I'm going to go with. And if you want to laugh at me, that is totally fine. I am an idiot. But it's a great question to start off this week's mailbox. And something a little bit different. If the season starts in July or later, I guess this question kind of works for... Do you think there will be a Drive to Survive Season 3? Personally, I think it's unlikely. Thank you for your question and... In all honesty, I've not really thought too much about Drive to Survive because we got Drive to Survive, what was it, a week before this first race or the supposed first race of 2020 and then obviously everything's kicked off like it has and I watched Drive to Survive Season 2 through once and then I was starting to watch it through a second time every time I went to the gym because there's screens there so I was trying to, you know, rather than speed rush it and binge watch it, try and watch it a little bit more. But obviously I got halfway through and then gym closed and everything's happened like it has. So I've not watched it back through a second time. But in terms of a season three, that's interesting. Because I don't obviously have the official numbers of how well it does, but every time I go on to Netflix, it's always there in my face, watch Drive to Survive, watch Drive to Survive. And I mean, if you're stumbling across this video, it's most likely that you've seen Formula One before or some kind of motor racing. So I imagine it's the same for you as well. But I wonder for those who don't watch Formula One, if it's still the case. And I'm still interested to see how many people get converted to watching the likes of Formula One through Drive to Survive. So if we do have a half season, I don't see why not. I don't see why we wouldn't have a drive to survive. Yes, it's likely for the first few races of the season we'll be behind closed doors. I think that's going to be an option that we're going to have to get used to. And to be honest, I'm cool with. <laughs> At this rate, I'm fine with any racing. Behind closed doors, whatever. Will they allow the Netflix team to be there? Well, that all depends on the kind of deal Netflix has with Formula One. But even if we have eight races... I think there's a really good story to tell there. They would have been with the teams already throughout winter testing like they have been for previous seasons of Drive to Survive. They would have been there for the chaos at the Australian Grand Prix. And look, even if it's a shorter season of Drive to Survive, just seeing what quite happened at the Australian Grand Prix weekend, because we still don't quite know. And it was still a hell of a mess. We were going into Saturday expecting qualifying. Well, was it? No, it was practice, wasn't it? It was Friday. We were expecting practice running and it didn't go ahead. But we weren't too sure with about an hour to go until the first session. So seeing that unfold behind closed doors that Drive to Survive does so, so well, I'm still interested to do. And even if we get eight races, I still think like they've done for season one and two. There's stories looking at Williams, seeing if they can survive through this mess at the moment, looking at the likes of Mercedes, maybe talking to Hamilton and seeing what kind of effect that would have if he won his seventh title. Stories like that, you know, we could have episodes or and, and for the first time in Drive to Survive history, we could have a Formula One 70 years looking back in time rather than just focusing on modern Formula One. Maybe that will introduce some of the newer fans to some of the history of the sport. 
which I feel could be quite fun and quite unique, and doing more unique episodes rather than 2020. But I still think it'll be okay, and knowing Netflix, they're always going to find a story. But I, I thought that was a really different question, so thank you, gamer. Kyren is how I'm going to say it, but I'm so convinced that's wrong. I'm sorry. Moving on to question number two comes from BLVE, believe... That's got to be believe. Anyway, BLVE is what we will go with because I can pronounce that. Another really good question and another one that I think we're all going to have, you know, from our own unique perspectives, how long we've watched Formula One, how much we've been exposed to Formula One in on YouTube, on social media. But here's the question. Does recency bias lead to drivers such as Hulkenberg, Magnussen and Vettel being unfairly assessed? Interesting you've included KMAG in that question, but I'll get back to that in a moment. And in some regard, does this create over-expectations for drivers whose cars performed better than expected, such as Carlos Sainz? This is a kind of question I love to see. Because I know, for a fact, I can kind of give a almost a unique perspective on this, because... I'm kind of an F1 YouTuber. I know that ever since I started YouTube a couple of years ago, I've put my opinions on the line and I've got no issue doing that. I love it. But it means I also get instant feedback for you guys telling me if I overrate a driver, underrate a driver. And yes, we've all got our own unique opinions. But I certainly remember a few years ago in 2017, the first year I kind of did YouTube. I did most race reviews, not all of them, but I did, I'd say, 75% of race reviews I, I did on the channel. And at the time, I was mega impressed with a young driver called Carlos Sainz, and I was very disappointed with a Kevin Magnussen at Haas F1. Now, at the time, I got a little bit slandered for saying Carlos Sainz was as good as he was. And at the time as well, I also got a lot of people telling me that Magnussen deserved a second chance. And very quickly, over a couple of seasons, you see public perspectives change. And all of a sudden, whereas I was being told off for saying Carlos Sainz was too good, I now, not very often, but some people say I don't rate him high enough. And it's really interesting to see how some people only remember a driver's last couple of races. And to be fair, that's not a bad point. I can't remember quite who said it, and it's a famous quote, and I should know, but a driver is only as good as their last race. May have been Nicky Lauda. Someone please correct me on that. But yeah, a driver is only good as their last race. And I kind of see where people are coming from, because we've certainly seen with drivers, let's say Vettel and Grosjean, you didn't mention Grosjean in your question, which I appreciate, but certainly Seb and Grosjean, they're the kind of driver that one bad weekend, I feel, can spiral them a little bit. But also one brilliant weekend, like we saw Grosjean especially in Austria 2018, he almost had a faultless season after that fourth place finish. It can really inspire them for, like I say, Grosjean, that was, what, maybe 12 races extra? He really started to perform and get back on his feet. And Seb, as soon as he won in Singapore made almost zero mistakes, would have won in Russia, most likely, if his car didn't break down. So it's really interesting to see the psyche of the drivers, but I think from a fan's perspective, recency bias, I believe it is a thing. But also, again, like I said, there's some people, and this is what I think a lot of people don't necessarily take into account, I can be talking to some of you, and I know you may have seen one Formula One race, and that's cool with me, I have no issue with that. But I think it's some people... That I've maybe watched since the 70s. There's some people that watch since the 2000s. Some that started or have always known Mercedes dominance. There's always going to be a mix of opinions anyway. So, yeah, for sure, recency bias is a thing. Hulkenberg, I've not mentioned. And all, by the way, I could be here for hours talking about recency bias. Hulkenberg, I still feel, was one of the best drivers in 2018. 2019 didn't do so well. And sadly, the game of Formula One politics didn't quite go his way. But yeah, I think public perspective and recency bias is a thing. But I also think opinions you see online and things like that, you should always take with a little pinch of salt. And at the end of the day, if a driver's been rubbish for one season, but they've smashed every other year, I think you're right to question that. I, I think that's fair enough. And from a Grosjean fan perspective... 
although I think he gets a little bit too much hate, I can see where people are getting it from. And I personally don't like using the excuse he was good in 13, he was great in 14 and 15, because I admit that was quite some time ago now, and I think things develop. But certainly, one season, maybe even a few races back that people forget, yeah, I, I think recency bias can be a little bit unfair. Moving on to question number three, Lorenzo Letter asks a question that we kind of covered in, I was going to say yesterday's video, it wasn't yesterday, a couple of days ago in the return of transfer talk, we kind of covered this, but I feel I didn't do it in enough detail. Is Antonio Giovinazzi ready for a Ferrari seat? Now, in the Transfer Talk episode, we had the little chat, a little discussion about, well, it was more than a little discussion, it was about 20 minutes long, but we spoke about drivers that potentially could replace Sebastian Vettel if he or Ferrari decides he's not the right man for them. And I still think Seb is the right guy for Ferrari at the moment, but if he did move on for whatever reason, we did maybe consider that Giovinazzi could be that guy. Is he ready right now? I don't think so. There's no denying he had an awesome junior career. And actually, when you look at a lot of the guys that have moved up into Formula One over the last couple of years, Giovinazzi's junior career is one of the better ones. And whilst he didn't beat Gasly to that GP2 title, he was a rookie in that season and really gave it a good run for his money in that KFC branded yellow car. So I think he's a driver that needs a little bit more respect than he gets. I think his first ever two Grand Prix in Formula 1 for Sauber in 2017 were two very special races, especially in Melbourne. Did a really good job in Melbourne. And that goes under the radar. But last season, up against Kimi Raikkonen in his full season, or full first season in Formula 1, his rookie season, he did okay. The first half of the year, yeah, I'll concede, wasn't brilliant. And I think if he'd have continued that trend for the rest of the year... They may have even considered replacing him for 2020. But in that second half of the season, after the summer break, he really bounced back and was starting to show signs that in 2020, he could have the potential to become that team leader, or at least be on the pace with Raikkonen most weekends. And I think by the end of 2019, was definitely knocking on Raikkonen's door to be beating him in qualifying and beating him in the race. So if he can continue the progress he showed last year, I would like to see him, first of all, beat Raikkonen at the end of 2020. I think that then proves he's ready for a Ferrari seat. Because you've got to remember, this isn't like moving from Alfa Romeo to Haas. This isn't like going to a McLaren. This is Ferrari. If he goes into that seat, he's expected to at least challenge for race victories. And we saw with Leclerc, someone who had dominated Formula 2. I've never seen a more impressive Formula 2 campaign than Charles Leclerc. Russell's was good, but Leclerc's was insane. And he came to Ferrari with people not too sure if he was ready. Joe Venazzi, I think, would get a little bit even more pressure on his back. But then I suppose people were expecting him, I would say anyway, more to go into a number two role than be pushing Leclerc for a number one role, number one status. So is he ready for Ferrari? Not just yet. But I think if he can improve like he did over the course of last year, I don't see why not in the future. But he's going to have to make another big step up in 2020. Question number four, and one that I think some of you won't be interested. Apologies, but I wanted to talk about it. And it comes from Nitnalav 1994. That is definitely pronounced wrong. So we're almost four for four today. Ah, oh, my goodness me. Anyway, it's a question about the Formula 1 2020 game and it's asking about my thoughts on the new features announced for the 2020 game and I know pretty much it is just talking about the new manager mode that's going into the game and I cannot wait for this. I think this is going to be so so cool and I was questioning whether to do my own separate video I was going to do one yesterday when the announcement came out. I really wanted to talk about it, but I had a speak or a chat is a better way of putting it. I had a little chat with um, Jordan from the F1 Debate Show and him and Lyle are doing an episode on Saturday. And I thought, you know what, I'll let them say their piece first and then I'll see if I can mention anything or bring anything new to the table. But for now, I think it looks really, really cool. I personally know 
that I think there's definitely different alleys people can take with this. You know, the 11th team, we're going to have liveries most likely that are going to be like the multiplayer liveries. So it has the potential to be really cool, but also they can stick out like a sore thumb. Now, I'm not a MotoGP fan whatsoever, but I bought the game a couple of years ago when it was on sale. I think it was like £7. It was a couple of years old game, but that has a manager mode, and that works really, really well. You kind of choose your base layer colour and your team colours. You can then choose a livery to go on top. You pick a sponsor, which I believe is the route Formula 1 are going for the 2020 game. So if that's similar, really happy with that. And then each season, you can also update your livery, which I think can be really fun. I'm looking forward to seeing how the teammate dynamic works. I want to see, I pray, we can bring up a driver from Formula 2. I think that'd be so, so cool. And I would also love it if we can make managerial decisions to say, look, I'd like Hamilton in the team. I'd like Grosjean to come drive with us. Not many of you are going to be saying that, but I certainly will. I want to, you know, halfway through the season, I want my manager or my secretary to come over and say, look, Hamilton's at a contract. We can sign him. Shall we do it on a on a, on a a budget? We can do it a little bit cheaper. I, I want that a little bit more... Oh, what's the word? I want to feel like I'm living in the world of Formula One. The words escape me at the moment, and I, I've just tried to look it up, and I can't think of it. But yes, I want to feel like I'm living the world of a Formula One manager, and it'll be a little bit strange, a little bit like it is on MotoGP, because you're the team manager, but you're driving as well. So you're kind of doing two roles, but I'm so happy they've added it to the game. I've already decided in my head when it comes out in July, which July, that's fantastic as well. Also, the fact you can pick a calendar, what races are in and aren't, that is awesome. So, so cool. This was so, so needed. Split screens in as well, which I won't use, but... I remember back in some of the early editions, I did use with my brother when we both had the Xbox in the living room. So I know that's a feature that a lot of younger people will enjoy. But yeah, I know straight away I'm going to be doing some kind of series for this, probably over on Twitch. And I really want to bring back a team like Lotus, like Braun. I know some people want to bring in new teams. And hey, my car I drive in real life is a Toyota. Maybe I'll bring those back. But little things like that I'm going to really enjoy doing. And they made such big steps forward in 2019. This is definitely a massive step in the right direction from Cody's in 2020. And I'll leave that there because I can talk about this for hours. And I've kind of rushed through that. But I know some of you really aren't interested. But just before we get into the final question, I did mention it. And this kind of just finishes off what we just spoke about the little channel update is what I wanted to talk about because a few of you have been aware. I've been doing a few practice Twitch streams on, you guessed it, on Twitch. And I did, first of all, I just wanted to make sure everything was running. And to my surprise, my laptop can just about handle streaming, which I was not prepared for. There is quite a big fan noise in the background on occasion, which isn't great. And that needs to be addressed. But for now, it does the trick. And I've been streaming over on Twitch, which you can follow if you follow the link in the description. Once the video's over, though, please, guys. Um, and what I'm doing is I'll be doing a normal The Journey career mode is what I'm calling it at the moment. I haven't really decided on a name. But I'm starting on F1 2014, going all the way through to 2019. And by then, we might have caught up all the way to 2020, which could be cool. So yeah, I'm doing that on certain days. Then last Saturday, so about a week ago, was it? I can't remember when it was. Time just doesn't exist anymore. But yeah, about a week ago, we did our first open lobby on the F1 game, which was so, so fun. We did 10 races, five lap races, random grids. It was amazing. You guys loved it. I loved it. There were so many of you watching, taking part. That's going to be coming back for sure. And it's going to be back tomorrow evening. I would guess from half seven to half eight will be when it starts for a couple of hours. So if you're interested and if you're on the Xbox, feel free to come over. Feel free to join in and I'll be streaming on Twitch. So my plan is on a Monday, Wednesday and Friday will be YouTube videos. That's going to be three a week, which is more than I'm currently doing. 
But now I've got a schedule in place. Now coursework is out the way. That should fit in quite nicely. And on Monday and Wednesday, those videos are going to be pretty much what you've seen over the last few weeks. It'll be a Legends video, a Grand Prix history video, or a transfer talk, or just a random video. That'll be on Monday and Wednesday. On Friday, you'll get the mailbox, so we're moving it to Friday, just for the time being, while the world is in chaos. And then every day I'm not doing a YouTube video, you'll find me on Twitch, most likely in the evening. We might do it in the middle of the day, but most likely it'll be after 7.30 is usually how I'm going to be doing it. So I thought I'd update you there. Hopefully that tickles your fancy and hopefully that clears a few things up. But our final question, our audience participation question, where you can have your say in the comments below, comes from Gurgley's Technic Models. I really enjoyed your best liveries list. We did it a couple of episodes ago in Mailbox 36, I think it was. Can you do one about the worst liveries of the last decade? Now, I want to know your list or your just worst five because I've picked out, I've picked out 10. But if I'm being honest, there's only five I really feel bad about. So I'm going to do a top five, the worst five liveries, but I'm also going to do five honourable mentions which are also just a bit naff, in my opinion. 2010 Toro Rosso, I think is the worst Toro Rosso we've ever seen. That bull with a funny cartoon eye doesn't work for me. The 2010 Ferrari, I need to be careful here because this is slightly sacrilegious, but I'm not a fan of the barcode. Doesn't really do it for me. And also the 2010 Mercedes, the worst Mercedes we've seen since their return, a weird grey, the black they included was a little bit odd, but I think in all those I've just mentioned, maybe it was the 2010 chassis that just didn't help a lot of these liveries. I'm also going to put in honourable mentions, the 2017 Haas, there's sacrilege for you, me not liking a Haas livery, but this one, there was a version with a white nose and a red nose, either of them just don't really work for me. A little bit bland. They tried to spice it up from the white version in 2016, but I think that was a hell of a lot better than this rubbish we saw in 2017. But the other honourable mention that I'm going to take out of the top five is the 2015 Manor. And the reason I'm taking this out of the top five is it was quite a nice livery to start the season off with. Red, black, white wasn't the best we've seen, but it was okay. They added a sponsor late on in the year because they were a bit short of cash. Flexbox added the blue, didn't work. The 2017 version, the year at uh, 2016, sorry, the year later, I think was quite nice, just red and blue. But this one, no, didn't work for me. An absolute butchering from the sponsor. But our worst five, yes, I'm going to include the 2016 Sauber. They could have just done so so much more. The nose with that little curvy stripe in it of yellow looks rubbish. The yellow on the side pod looks rubbish and it's just plain and it doesn't need to be when you consider the huge strides they made in 2017. I gave that my favourite livery of the decade and I will stand by that forever. I love it. But this version, awful, awful. I don't want to say much more. Number four and number three, I might as well talk about together because sadly, it's two of the three liveries produced from HRT. Their 2010 one isn't great, but again, it's, it's not dreadful. It doesn't really deserve to be in worst of the decade. But this 2012 monstrosity, I'm glad we didn't see that one. And this 2011 one, my goodness me, I'm kind of in two minds to put this as number one, the worst livery. Rubbish. Who ever thought about putting a checkered flag on the car? Would be a good idea. But our final two, number, oh, it's close between these two. And I think a lot of you pretty much know what one of these is, the 2019 Williams. And to be fair to that car, it's rubbish, but I've bashed on it all year long. So I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to leave it in second place. But my least favourite, and I'm lucky we didn't actually see this go racing, but it was going to until a very last minute change. The 2017 Force India. Now, for that season, they raced with the first ever pink Force India. But do you remember this ugly mess 
of a shark fin. The, the, the versions before in 15 and 16, the black, silver and orange, I really, really liked and almost put that on my top 10 best. But my goodness, I never thought a plain shark fin would ruin a car so, so much. Not to mention a fact they've gone for this weird grey, silver blend from the front. Oh, it's just not good. But also the Williams and HRTs are equally as bad. So I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments below. In the description, I will include the link to the Twitch channel. So if you want to get involved tomorrow with the open lobbies, you can do. You can follow that over. But if you just want to follow and keep up to date with YouTube, feel free to subscribe and hit that notification bell. And for Twitch, feel free to follow me. Thank you all so much for watching this week's episode of The Mailbox. If you want to ask questions for next week, comment section, Instagram, Twitter, all that good stuff. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.